Our Father and our God, we're grateful to be in your house yet again on this your day. We pray that you would bless this day as we consider your word, as we marvel in your Son, who he is, what he has done. We pray that all things that are done in your house this day would be honoring and pleasing to him. We pray that you would bless your servants who have prepared to preach in your uh, houses of worship, that your word would go forth mightily by the power of your Holy Spirit as he applies it to your saints, to uh, call those from death to life. Lord, we pray for a uh, great harvest of glory unto the name of Jesus Christ. And it is in that name that we pray. Amen. All right, so how many read the chapter on amillennialism this week? All right, good, got a few. This was, wasn't that the most simple and straightforward chapter. That's what I thought, too. Um, much, much easier to understand than dispensationalism. If you all understood that chapter, uh, please explain it to me later today. Um, but this is our fourth and final lesson on the different millennial views. Today we'll be considering amillennialism. Uh, we've looked at historic premillennialism, we've looked at dispensationalism, we've looked at postmillennialism, and now the final of the four views. And it's the second view that teaches that Jesus Christ will return after the millennial period. So we have two views that have the second coming, you see, preceding the millennial state. Here we have the second coming following the millennial period. Age, and the view. This view is called amillennialism with the negative prefix a. Ah. It could be mistaken, and some some in the millennial camp want to change the name. But it could be mistaken to mean that amillennialists don't believe in a millennium at all. The terminology is somewhat misleading. Amillennials definitely believe in a millennial period. I mean, we ha- we have to do something with it. It's there in Scripture in Revelation twenty. So we have to put it somewhere. So there's definitely uh, an amillennial position uh, or a uh, position for the millennium in that uh, system. But like the postmillennialists, the amillennialists don't believe the millennial period is a literal thousand years. So these two views have a lot in common. These two views have a lot in common. They hold to a second coming preceding a literal millennium. Both of the premillennial views, the, these are called the two postmillennial views. That can be somewhat misleading for obvious reasons, but they hold to a figurative millennium followed by the second coming. So if we can nail that down, that will help you a lot in identifying the two different views premillennial views, postmillennial views. Uh, that, will, that will really help you uh, in identifying those. So, in the, the amillennial view, the millennial period is not seen as a golden age, as it was with postmillennialism, or as an earthly reign, the two forms of premillennialism, but as an undefined millennial period uh, is the present age of gospel expansion. So, they take the binding of Satan in Revelation 20 to mean that the church is going to go forth in power and bring the gospel to the nations and baptize them, disciple them, teach them all things that the Lord Jesus has commanded us. The fulfillment of the Great Commission. Right now, Christ is sowing gospel seeds in the present age. The eternal age is Him enjoying His harvest. Second coming, He's coming back as a reaper. He came the first time as a sower. The second time, He's coming as a reaper. So, are you ready, is, is the, the, the gospel question for us. So, according to amillennialism, the millennium refers to the period of human history from the resurrection of Christ right up to His second coming, barring, of course, the little season when Satan is released before the close of the millennium. So, we have just two ages. We have this age in amillennialism, the age of gospel expansion, and we have the age to come. So one of the things I like about all millennialism is that it's the only view of the four in my limited understanding that holds to the biblical two-age view. I can't square that with any of the other three. All millennialism is the only one that holds to a two-age view. There's this age, the symbolic millennium of the uh, gospel expansion. There's the age to come, the eternal state. 
You could even say in, in one sense uh, that the age of gospel expansion includes the millennium. It more or less overrides, but the gospel's been going forth in power since the Lord cursed the serpent in the garden. It's been going forth in power for uh, 6,000 years at this point. So, the millennium is figurative, represents a very long time. We know that Jesus was resurrected uh, the church started in the book of Acts, so it's, it's at least a 2,000-year millennium in the, in the view of the amillennialists. Definitely not a literal uh, thousand years. And that fits, of course, as we've seen with the hermeneutic of Revelation. It's a largely figurative book. We have lots of figurative imagery. Even in this, own, even in this passage before us, we have a figurative bottomless pit. Uh, that could, there's no way that could be literal. How can you release somebody from a bottomless pit where they would just fall for infinity? So literalism does not work when you apply it to Revelation 20. So it's a figurative millennium in the view of the amillennials has already at this point been 2,000 years. So we've looked at premillennialism, which tended toward a little, uh, tended to be a little too pessimistic. Postmillennialism maybe a little too optimistic. Amillennialism kind of strikes the balance a little more. Realistic and in reform circles, amillennialism is sometimes labeled as pessimistic by the postmillennialists. They're like, well, you know, y'all just don't have the, the same hope we do. Well, that's that's a little bit misleading. Uh, amillennialists, in, in my experience, are no less zealous for the growth and propagation of the church than postmillennialists. It's just we don't hold out hope for a golden millennial age. We labor in, in right now without hoping for a, a golden age. Yes, we pray for that. We mentioned that last week when we dealt with postmillennialism. I believe all Christians pray like postmillennialists. We pray for peace on the earth. We pray for wickedness to cease. We pray for the knowledge of God to cover the face of the earth as the waters cover the sea. So, premillennialists will also see amillennialists as somewhat pessimistic because they don't have all the excitement and drama of multiple comings of Christ and millennial kingdoms and Jewish blessings and all the rest of, I'll just say hoopla, that all that came with. So they're, they're charged to be a little bit pessimistic. My point is, I, I don't really like drama anyway, end times drama included, so you know I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. But um, I've, I've found amillennialists to, to be faithfully obeying Christ and spreading His gospel just as much as any of the other four. So I don't buy the, the charge that, that it's a negative eschatology that just uh, consigns the millennium to figurative, to, to being figurative and, well, there's just nothing special awaiting. Oh, the second coming of Christ is going to be the most glorious thing that ever happened. There's nothing dull and boring about that. So... There are, there are plenty of major proponents of amillennialism, just as there were for the other three views. Augustine, Martin Luther, John Murray, Louis Burkhoff, J.I. Packer. There's a number of amillennial theologians. So we get to the interpretation of Revelation 20, which of the four views in the book, only the historic premillennial uh, theologian as well as the amillennial offered uh, actual exposition of Revelation 20, which was helpful for those two. At least we had one of the pre-mill views and one of the post-mill views uh, offering that interpretation. So this is just going to be a summary of what, what um, Dr. Hokema wrote in, in the book. The, so the binding of Satan, according to the all-millennial view, is his defeat at the cross. That is when Satan was bound in the all-millennial view. And there are several scriptures that are cited in support of that, Jesus made reference several times that Satan was bound, figurative term meaning his power was minimized during his human life on earth. If we turn over to Matthew 12, we'll go over there for just a second. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. We'll start there. Matthew 12, 24, we read, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Not sure what logic they're using there. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? 
And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by, who, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he indeed may plunder his house. So Jesus here makes reference to binding the, the strong man. And then there's also a couple of other references. There is Jesus refers to the, the, the minimizing of the power of Satan or his, his effectiveness of his power when the disciples come back and say, Lord, we saw the demons being subject to us in your name. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven making reference to the success of the gospel ministry due to the fact Satan, his power has been limited. Uh, John 12, 31, also another, another reference there. John 12, 31. Turn over there real quick. Uh, Jesus is the one speaking here. He said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, Satan. Satan, the, the prince of the power of the air, the, the ruler of this, this present evil age. Uh, and then finally, Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2.14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So at Jesus' crucifixion, that was a crushing blow for Satan, a, a limiting of his, his power. So while Satan is bound during the figurative millennium, or that is his power has been limited in a way that it was not before, the nations are not kept in darkness as they were throughout the Old Testament. Can we have the next slide, please, Ethan? Thank you, sir. So we have, in the Old Covenant, we have the nations being kept in utter darkness. We have very, very few converts to the faith. Israel was the only nation in the Old Covenant that had revelation from God. We have just a handful of converts from all the rest of the nations of the world during the time of the Old Testament. We have um, Ruth, we have Jethro, we have Naaman, Rahab, we have the people of Nineveh that repented at the preaching of Jonah, which we praise God for all of the souls that are saved by His grace, but it was a very, very few number. The revelation of God and His special mercies and His saving graces were focused primarily on Israel. Satan kept the nations in complete and utter darkness for the most part. But precisely because Jesus has defeated and figuratively bound Satan, He gives to His bride, the church, the commission to go make disciples of all nations. He says, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. That's the basis on which he makes his next statement. Go therefore. What are you afraid of? I bound the ruler of the prince of this world. Go therefore. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church. And so the nations that were formerly bound by Satan, <coughs> excuse me, they are now receiving the gospel by the work of the church, which is, of course, propelled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we have the gospel. We have Bibles being translated um, the, the, the church of God is going forward. Can we have the next slide, please, Ethan? Here's just one more view of it. This one's from uh, Wayne Grudem's book here. We have amillennialism, no future millennium. We have the church age. And then we have, at the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of believers, resurrection of unbelievers, judgment, new heaven, new earth. And one thing about uh, resurrection... While the gospel goes forth on the earth, the saints have come to life through being born again. We saw that phrase in Revelation 20. Let me turn back over there real quick. <clears throat> Revelation 20. We see that uh, they came to life there in verse... Uh, 4, toward the end of verse 4. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years... As the gospel goes forth and is applied by the Holy Spirit, the saints are regenerated, born again. Uh, they share the gospel until their death, and upon their death reign with Christ over the present millennial age. In one sense, we are made kings and priests now. We reign with Christ now. 
uh, as we share the gospel, fulfilling His commission. Um, Ephesians 2, verses 1, 5, and 6 follow the same order. They're dead, they're quickened, then they're raised up. Following our our order here in uh, Revelation, the saints are uh, dead in sins and they're quickened and then they're raised up. And the saints who have taken part in the first resurrection, we hear the word resurrection, we think of a corpse coming out of a grave. But that's not the only way in which the Scriptures speak about resurrection. They speak about uh, resurrection uh, with, with regeneration as well. Um, the, in in uh, Revelation 20, we have the, the, the saints coming to life and reigning with Christ for a thousand years over the symbolic millennium. That is when the, uh, the saints are in heaven, reigning with Christ, who have gone into glory. And then there are His saints, made kings and priests on the earth. Revelation 5.10, reigning with Him even, even now. And then we have, in Revelation 5.10, uh, I'm sorry, in Revelation 20, verse uh, 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. I'm a lineal interpret this to mean uh, the rest of the dead did not come to life till the thousand years were ended as a parenthetical statement saying that those who were never saved did not die in Christ and reign with Him. Uh, the Greek word akri here, which is the until in our English Bibles, can also mean as long as or up to. As long as the figurative millennium is, as long as this church age is, those who are not born again do not die and reign with Christ. And that's how they interpret that. They don't see it as a bodily resurrection, which the uh, premillennialists do. Can we go back to our last slide, Ethan? Thank you, sir. Or I'm sorry, the, the fourth slide. My bad. The first slide, there you go. So we have a, uh, different resurrections. We have different resurrections in the, in the, the premillennial views that coincide with some of the, in the, in the dispensational view, a secret second coming. And then we have, really, third coming. The, the amillennials see the resurrection language here as being uh, the coming to life in, in regeneration. And so, when the thousand years are ended, we're told what happens to those who never took part of the first resurrection, who were never regenerated. What, what happens to them? Well, they're victims of the second death which is the eternal punishment. We read that. They're thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire, verse 14 of Revelation 20. Uh, We're either born twice and die once. You're born once physically, and then you're regenerated spiritually, and then you die once, and you're with the Lord. Or you're born once to die twice. You come into this world dead in sins and trespasses, then you die a physical death, and then you go where the worm dieth not to die an eternal death. There are only three times in Scripture that the bodily resurrection... Now we're switching gears here. We're going to a bodily resurrection. There are only three times in Scripture that the bodily resurrection of believers and unbelievers are mentioned in the same passage. Uh, Daniel 12, 2, John 5, 28, 29, and Acts 24, 15. And in each of those passages, the bodily resurrection of both believers and unbelievers is said to happen at the same time time. That's, that's critical for our understanding. Um, what, what, when the bodily resurrection takes place. This is impossible. The fact that the, resu- the bodily resurrection of both unbelievers and believers is said to happen at the same time. This is impossible to square with any premillennial view that sees bodily resurrections happening before and after millennial periods. It's impossible to square. So, bodily resurrection. There's only one bodily resurrection for believers and unbelievers, but there is a spiritual resurrection in the souls of believers at the point they become believers, at the point they're saved. Revelation 20, 11 through 14 also uh, teaches that judgment follows the defeat of Satan, which follows the millennium, which again proves the, the chronology of all millennialism. So some inherent problems, we've kind of come up to some of those already. Some of them with amillennialism center around the term came to life. We read that and we read the term resurrection and we think, oh, well, you know, 
a corpse coming to life. And so some of the, the, the terminology there can uh, be problematic for the amillennial view. The Greek verb is essaison in Greek from the uh, Greek verb zao, which means to live. Um, this particular conjugation of the verb is found here only in Revelation 24, 5, verses 4 and 5 in all the New Testament. And the Greek verb zao is never used in the New Testament for life after death except in reference to a bodily resurrection, which, again, the amillennial view says, well, the, the resurrection that's happening here is salvation. Coming to life, saved, made a kingdom and priest, reigning with Christ, then comes the, the end. We're reigning with Christ whether we're on the earth or in heaven. We are... Uh, made kings and priests, of course. So, the word can be used of coming to life spiritually, however, as it is used in John 5.25, one of the passages we mentioned earlier. And that is the meaning that the amillennialists ascribe to the verb here in Revelation 24-5. through So, come to life can be a little bit tricky, uh, can be problematic for some. And then there's a second problem with amillennialism where Satan is said to be still active. We all know the verse, 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan roams about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Well, if we're saying right now in amillennialism that Satan is bound, what do we do with 1 Peter 5, 8? We've got a bound Satan and a roaming Satan. That seems to be contrary language. Well, there's, there's several explanations for this. Uh, Hokema, the author of the amillennial chapter in our book, he offered the defense that Revelation 20 refers to the binding of Satan in a way that means he only cannot deceive the nations in such a way as he did before the incarnation and crucifixion of Jesus. Okay, that, 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 makes, sense. that makes sense. There is a sense, however we, however we grapple with it, and that's one of the issues with the millennial view, however we grapple and, and want to define Satan's being bound, to what extent, um, there is a sense in which he's bound and yet roaming. Really in whatever view you take. You have to take Revelation 20 and 1 Peter 5. We're not going to cut one out of the Bible at the expense of the other. Um, that would be blasphemous to the Holy Spirit because he wrote it all for us. So we have to take both of them. There is one sense in which he's bound and yet roaming. I think the analogy of a leash works really well here. Satan's binding is provisional. It doesn't mean his power is completely stripped away, only that he cannot do what verse 3 of Revelation 20 says he cannot do, deceive the nations anymore. I think Hokum has got a, a fair point there. Uh, I think it was Luther that said, the devil is God's devil, and he's got him on a leash. The devil can't do anything that the Lord doesn't first give him permission to do, because he's a creature just like us. More powerful than us, Different than us in some ways, but he's a creature just like us. And so apart from the sovereign will of God, Satan couldn't touch Job. Um, he, he can't get to any of God's children unless the Lord says, okay, you have my permission. So he's got him on a leash. So there's a sense in which he's roaming, a sense in which he's bound. And that's part of the tension, one of the, one of the problems with um, all millennialism. So... By way of conclusion, we'll leave a little time for questions and answers. The church is on the offensive. Whatever, whatever view we take, the church is on the offensive. We have the promise that the gates of hell are not going to withstand the attacks of the church. Uh, we see from Bibles being translated and printed, missionaries going forth, churches are forming, souls are being baptized, the kingdom of God is growing. It, it appears Satan is bound. Uh, and, and, and we look at the success of the sowing of gospel seeds. And so, we, we, thank, we thank and praise God for that and seek to be a part of that, uh, that He would use us in His uh, sowing ministry. Uh, all millennialism is not hyper-Calvinistic. The, the view that, well, since God's elected some to salvation, it doesn't really matter what we, what we do, it doesn't matter if we share the gospel. Well, that, Hyper-Calvinism is just another term for disobedience. We're called to go share a gospel. You know, whether, whether, the, whether we have a promised uh, golden age for the church coming or not, whether or not we have um, believers and unbelievers on the earth at the same time, 
maybe doing some witnessing there in the premillennial view. We're called to be faithful. We're called to share the gospel. Now, with the breath that we have, we're called to praise the Lord and obey Him. Uh, so our millennialism sh- it should not tend to hyper-Calvinism. Uh, it's, it's missional. And our millennialism, I have found to be, out of the four views, the, the least fanatical and the, perhaps the most reasonable. Of, of all of the views. And it's, it's not diverse. It doesn't have multiple ages that we have to square. Well, is this the present evil age or is this some age between this and the eternal age? Uh, just, just two ages to have to work with. And I don't, I don't see all millennialism as hopeless. Um, one could make the case that more souls are saved in the millennium of all millennialism than any other view in eschatology. The case could be made for that. So I'm an amillennialist somewhat loosely. There, I have brothers and sisters in, in all the rest of the camps, and I'm happy to admit that. Um, I think there are problems with the premillennial views, that especially dispensationalism, that I find hard to reconcile with Scripture. But I'm happy to, to break bread and, and fellowship with, with all stripes and want that, want that to, be, to be known. I mean, we've, we've, had, we've had a laugh or two at some of the, some of the craziness of, of dispensationalism together, but... You know, again, it's it's not an issue on which our salvation hinges. There's not, you know, the more sanctified people obviously hold the post millennialism, and the least sanctified hold the dispensationalism. It, none of that. We're we're all growing in sanctification. Maybe this study's been some something of that for you. I hope so. But uh, that's uh, that's all millennialism coming to life and reigning with Christ, regeneration, rest of the dead are resurrected bodily to a uh, state of condemnation. And the church is in the millennium now. It's a symbolic, figurative time, and it will conclude with the coming of Christ, or with the, uh, the releasing of Satan for a little while prior to the second coming of Christ, if you will. So there's, there's all millennialism. Um, again, if you, if you leave this going, well, I think he, his case for historic premillennialism was the most convincing. Great, fine. Postmillennialism, I like that one best. Great, fine. Um, this was more just trying to show you how the, the different views uh, understand Revelation 20 and the millennium. So we'll take, we'll take some questions. My palms are already getting sweaty. Any questions on Revelation 20? Yes, brother. I got one. The, um, Go for it. You might not deceive the nations any longer. Um, it's hard for me to reconcile with millennialism. <laughs> nations are being deceived. We heard from Renato last week about Satan and his power. I mean, I, don't, I read the chapter on millennialism. I didn't get a good sense of how he argued that Satan might not deceive the nations any longer. That seems like a pretty straightforward sentence to me that is not true in the amillennialist symbolic millennium. So, he might not deceive the nations any longer, so, so they're being deceived in the way of, you would say, Unbiblical worldviews being propagated. Correct. Okay, yeah, and that's that is that is a. Gospel, he mentioned the gospel a few times. There's certainly many nations where the gospel has gone backwards. You know, where there's not near as many sure uh, Bibles or Christians in that nation than there were 200 years ago. Things like that. So. Right, and and that that's we get into. We, yeah, the numbers game is an interesting one to get into. Some have said that well, you know, in the Middle East where you have. You know, Islam and you have Sharia law and a bunch of wickedness, you have more Christians or more souls that have come to Christ in the last 30 years than in the whole you know, prior 1,300-year history of Islam. So the numbers can be read different ways. Yes, there are, there are backslidings. There are uh, nations that, I guess we would say, apostatize according to the uh, understanding of the, the amillennial position. But what we are seeing, and I think what, what the deceive the nations any longer. I think if we understand that to mean keep them away from the gospel, then we can say that the gospel has gone forth. Whether or not every single nation has fully embraced the gospel and has implemented Bible uh, doctrine in their nation, that, that would be more post-millennialism. We, if, we, if all the nations were to do that, we would see this, the millennium of post-millennialism. Um, we, we do see the gospel going forth. And so I think... I think yeah, you have a fair point, brother. The, um, if we, it depends on what, what we mean by deceive the nations no longer. I understand that to mean that they're not going to be kept from the light of the gospel. 
kept in the darkness. Whether or not they accept the gospel, it's still going forth. We're still seeing from these nations that before we may have had no converts. Well, some of the nations didn't even exist in um, Old Testament times. We are still seeing the gospel go forth, missionaries going there, churches being planted. To now, the, the, the number of uh, languages left to translate the Bible into is slimmed down significantly. So we are seeing some, but yes, deceive the nations no longer. We have to yeah, define what we mean by that term. Anthony. Uh, question going after that, going on after that, um, with all millennialism, how do they reconcile this with another text? So we have Revelation 20, and then in verse 7 uh, and 8, it says, And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. And then when you look at 2 Thessalonians uh, 5, Because you were saying that all millennials believe that um, Satan is bound now. You mean 1 Thessalonians 5, brother? No, sir. 2 uh, Thessalonians 2 has three chapters. 2 Thessalonians 2. 2, okay. And if you'd like to read it for us, um, I think it's verse 6 through 12. Yes, yeah. This is a um, passage on the end times, 2 Thessalonians 2. Man of lawlessness being revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2.6 And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So if I'm understanding you right, Anthony, you're saying that how do all millennialists reconcile the happenings of 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 20 Within the millennial period, yes. There are some amillennialists that hold the position that actually, when, when, when you see nations start to uh, reject the gospel, like Brother Mitchell is pointing out, they'll say, well, Satan's released now. We're in that little season. There are some that believe we're in that now as they see nations begin to fall away. There are some that hold that view that would, um, that would interpret it. Not whole, though. What, what did the whole hold to in regards to this delusion that happens in Second Thessalonians? I would put that that uh, I would put this delusion in the little period when Satan's released. I don't necessarily believe we're in that now. Some amillennialists do, but I still believe that is that is future for between there, right at the tail end of the millennium, right before the the second coming, if that makes any sense. So yeah, I believe the delusion of Second Second Thessalonians two is the releasing of Satan. Yes, definitely, and we'll. See if, we'll see when Christ comes back if we're in that now or if it's still a future event. I can't answer that question. I'm not sure. Haven't been to the... He's still defeated. Amen, brother. We're glad for that. We're glad for that. He's been crushed. The, the, the seed of the woman has crushed the head of the serpent. And we're, we, we are the fruits of that. So, any more questions? All right, very good. Well, either I explained everything so well, all your questions are answered, or you're t utterly confused and don't even know how to formulate a question. Uh, maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and then there's a fifth view. And this fifth view, I really like this fifth view. There's a view of uh, panmillennialism. And there are a number in this church that hold to this view. Uh, panmillennialism is the view that in the end, it's all going to pan out. And so if you're a pan-millennialist, you don't have to worry about hermeneutics and, and all the reconciling texts and everything else with all of those views. So pan-millennialism, that's, that's a safe one for sure. Nobody's going to uh, take you to task over that. They may ask you questions about when do you believe the, the um, deception of 2 Thessalonians 2 is? When do you believe the millennium is? Well, we'll leave that for the, uh, the pan-millennialists to uh, give us what their interpretation is. But yeah, the millennium... 
It's important because it's in the Scriptures, but it's, it's not, our salvation doesn't hinge on our millennial view. We want to emphasize that again. We want to be careful not to uh, anathematize those that hold to different eschatology and be aware that every single millennial view that we've gone over has had issues. There's not a single one of them that's just squeaky clean problem free. They've all got texts that seem to you know, cut in on, on their nice and, and clean interpretation. There's been problematic uh, hermeneutics with, with some of them. There's been problems with exegesis, problems with the, the Greek terms. There have been um, problems with the, viewing the two ages. So whatever you hold to, again, what, we'll go back to the introduction. Whatever you hold to, we want it to be leading to a practical theology of obedience to God, that we still fear Him, we still obey Him, love Him, serve Him in whatever we do. And we want it to uh, be an eschatology that is leading to a practical theology. We don't want to just have a pie-in-the-sky view of, well, Jesus is going to come back and sort it all out. I don't have to be bothering with you know, sharing the gospel, evangelizing my neighborhood, my, my workplace. No, we want a practical theology that, that, that drives us to share the gospel here and now. Regardless of when he comes back, when the millennial state is, we're to be obedient now with what we know we're to do. The, the, the millennium can be an obscure text for us. The Great Commission is a clear text for us. And we're never to, to negate our obedience to the clear text of Scripture on the grounds of an obscure text of Scripture. And that's absolutely paramount. So we interpret the, clear, or the, the unclear by the clear, and we're clearly told to go forth and share the gospel, whatever, whatever happens in the millennium. And whatever happens, when, when Satan is released and Gog and Magog come together for battle, that, that should not paralyze us with fear. What did we just read in 2 Thessalonians 2? The man of lawlessness, Satan's henchman that comes forth, how does Jesus Christ destroy him? With a great struggle and much sweat and blood and he barely comes out with a victory? No, he breathes and he's gone. Okay, that Marvel and Hollywood will never come out with a superhero that has that kind of power. Never breathes and he's gone. So we have, we have great hope regardless, again, of, of where these go. It's not unimportant, but we don't want to make it overly important, as, as so many have done. I was asked to do this study, so I've uh, had to grapple with these things, but it's, it's something that we want to have a view on, but hold to it loosely. Because I'm willing to com- confess that maybe all of them are wrong. Maybe all of them, all of them certainly have their issues, their, their struggles, but we await the second coming, and in the end, you know, we can, uh, the, the, the Christian view of eschatology in two words, we win. We win. That's the Christian eschatology. Let's close in prayer. Father and our God, we're grateful for the time we've been able to consider these views, and we do pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us in our uh, obedience to your great commission, that we would be about uh, the furtherance of your gospel, the growth of your kingdom. Lord, we know that whatever Satan is up to, he's up to by your divine decree. And we know that whatever he does, it is because you have foreordained it and it is for the good of your church and ultimately for the glory of your own great name. And so we rest in your uh, sovereignty over all things. We, we pray that you would help us to be obedient, to love you and serve you and to fear you while we are... Uh, on this earth for a short time, that it would be spent uh, serving you, O Lord, and not uh, consumed uh, unduly with uh, end times prophecies and and visions that that keep us from obeying what you have given us to do. We pray that you would help us, O Lord, to to be faithful during this this present evil age in which we live, when when so many nations do fall away, and, and souls, individual souls fall away, our own friends and neighbors and family. We pray that you'd help us to stand fast in the faith, not forsake you and turn our back on you, but that we would be faithful to proclaim your gospel, to be found in your field working until you come back. We pray these things in your name, all for your glory. Amen.